Okay, I want to say at the outset that I'm not here going to be trying to assess the overall prospects of uniting human psychology and evolutionary theory. Instead, I'm going to be discussing a particular influential way of thinking about that integration that I think probably doesn't work, and I want to explore the implications of it's not working, assuming that I'm right, for the kinds of questions that philosophers may be interested in, either about moral psychology or about morally or socially relevant features of human psychology. Okay. Um, I'm going to argue, I'm going to, I'm going to argue that evolutionary considerations often adversely affect psychologists and philosophers' evaluations of theories in human psychology because the inferential practices in a wide body of evolutionary psychology or sociobiology unwarrantedly favor reductionist or nativist theories. I'm going to say that these, theory, these practices are nevertheless in a certain sense, which maybe even Jerry Fodor would think is okay if I change the wording, meaning constitutive, that if they're so centrally built into some of these disciplines that it's very difficult to understand the disciplines without taking them on board. I'm going to draw uh, three philosophical uh, lessons, um, and I'm going to focus on the way in which philosophers interested in being uh, philosophical naturalists and interested in moral psychology could go astray. Um, okay, my target here uh, is the influence of what I'm going to call extrapolative sociobiological or evolutionary psychology. I have in mind patterns of inference uh, in which an evolutionary scenario is offered uh, to the effect that certain behaviors were exhibited in humans in the environment of evolutionary adaptation. A psychological theory is identified which predicts those behaviors in the environment of evolutionary adaptation, and in which a conclusion is reached that evolutionary theory predicts or su supports or gives us good reason to believe the particular theory. Sometimes the same kind of inference pattern goes in a slightly different way. Often one offers a psychological theory, T, which predicts behavior in the EEA. You then offer a scenario where selection favors the behavior, and then you conclude that evolutionary theory predicts or supports or whatever uh, the theory. And the big worry um, that I'm going to develop is that very, very often evolutionary theory, as deployed in these scenarios, doesn't support the theory T over a wide range of relevant alternatives that would predict the same behaviors in the environment of evolutionary adaptation. Very often these are reductionist or nativist theories, so I'm going to claim that very often um, unwarranted credibility is assigned to a particular theory. Let me talk about classic examples. I don't mean to say that these are representative so that if one of these is wrong, you should write off the whole literature, but I'm trying to pick examples that people who aren't into this literature may have heard of. So there was once, once upon a time in the very long ago, um, um, uh, uh, Wilson in uh, Sociobiology of the New Synthesis speculated that in the environment of evolutionary adaptation, altruism reduced individual fitness. Notice that um, as a claim about the psychological disposition altruism, that isn't part of the definition. Um, and so it had to have been established by uh, kin selection, and he concluded that very probably uh, underlying the note, they, our altruistic motives were some kin regarding or xenophobic motives that were hardwired in. So you tell an evolutionary story about the way in which altruistic behaviors arose in the EA, and out comes, among other things, a conclusion about an innate and relatively non-malleable pair of dispositions, one altruistic and one xenophobic. Um, a more, an example that has a little bit more staying power is, is a, uh, uh, Daly and Wilson's 1997 discussion of child abuse and other risks of not living with both parents. They say child rearing is a costly, prolonged undertaking. A parental psychology shaped by natural selection is therefore unlikely to be indiscriminate. Rather, we should expect parental feelings to vary as a function of the prospective fitness value of the child in question to the parent. Notice that two things are going on here. They, they, they seem to think that there's good reason to think that in the environment of evolutionary adaptation, people mainly cared for their own offspring or for closely related children, and they think that that conclusion underwrites the conclusion that we have a disposition that's still with us with the same propositional content. Let me indicate what I'm not criticizing. Uh, I'm not criticizing what I'm going to call explanatory sociobiology. If you find in humans or any other animals some characteristic that's very widespread, 
and you think that it's hardwired in, or for that matter, almost always learned or whatever, having decided that it's there, you, you um, investigate what its evolutionary history might have been, and you come up with a selective hypothesis. Um, those things are dicey, but I'm not talking about problems there. Um, I'm not uh, criticizing optimality modeling. Uh, it's the case that Gould and Lewinton made a big deal out of worrying about that. But suppose you have an optimality model that predicts certain behaviors B in the EEA, and uh, you think that for that reason they probably occurred. Nothing in this talk will address the question of whether you were reasoning soundly. Um, I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't do comparative uh, psychology. If in other animals in the environment of evolutionary adaptation there were behaviors with an evolutionary function S and you, F and you conclude that it's plausible that humans exhibited the same behaviors, say pair bonded male resistance to extra pair mating, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do that, maybe you shouldn't. Um, I'm not suggesting that if there are neural or perceptual mechanisms that you find in some other animals, you shouldn't think we might find them in humans. The uh, stuff about olfactory uh, cues about uh, major histocompatibility complex differences are not a target here. I'm not going to engage in a critique of adaptationism. Uh, three cheers for comparative behavioral ecology. Um, I'm going to claim about the extrapolative literature um, that its inferences are deeply flawed, but they define the research strategy for an important literature that philosophers often pay attention to. They align the prestige of evolutionary theory with reductive social psychology, and that the reference to evolutionary theory serves as a kind of methodological anesthesia that leads people not to, con not to take seriously alternative psychological conce uh, conceptions that ought to be in play. And I'll relate this to uh, issues about projectability judgments. I think that what we do when we do science at all is we make judgments of plausibility in the light of what we take to be the best available theories and their implications. That's what we should do. That's why biases are not bad in science. You should have your methodology biased by the correct theory. Um, if you believe that evolutionary theory singles out certain kinds of explanations in social psychology as the ones you ought to believe, well, that's a good reason for believing them. I just want to suggest that, the, that this, the singling out actually doesn't happen, and then I will talk about uh, some issues in semantics and moral psychology. Okay, so here's some terminology. I, tr I worked out these slides not having any idea what, what background everybody in the audience would have. Okay, by the environment of evolutionary adaptation for any sorts of organisms, people have in mind the, the environment in which um, such uh, phenotypic traits as were determined by selection were fixed. There isn't always one of those. If, you're, if, you're, if you look at raccoons, I mean, presumably they evolved once uh, in a stable way in sort of forest environments. Now that they've colonized cities, there's a new EEA. Um, by approximate explanation, I mean what everybody means, uh, an individual level, ahistorical, psychological, or neurophysiological explanation for behavior. Ultimate explanations are population level historical um, explanations, their explanations for how something arose in the EEA. Um, I've already explained the distinction between explanatory evolutionary psychology, that's offering an evolutionary explanation for a trait you've already confidently identified, and the target of criticism, which is extrapolative evolutionary psychology, in which evolutionary scenarios are said to predict traits whose existence is controversial um, and would be confirmed by further experimentation. I think the premise and the excitement about evolutionary uh, uh, psychology of the sort I have in mind is this. It's really hard to do both social psychology and cognitive social psychology of humans. You can't get a grant and run a society for 200 years and then write your dissertation. So wouldn't it be cool if the range of alternative hypotheses that are in the field could be narrowed by consideration from some other science? And um, that's a, a, a really attractive idea. And the idea is that evolutionary scenarios can very significantly narrow the range of hypotheses we need to take seriously. I want to say that I want to ask whether behavioral evolutionary scenarios of the sort people have in mind support those uh, constraints. I'm going to propose that the answer is no. Um, and I want to emphasize that the critique rests on premises from evolutionary psychologists and sociobiologists on literature. I'm going, to, I'm going to focus on the proximate ultimate distinction, which is everybody's you know, uh, conception. And there's no critique here of adaptationism. I'm taking no view at all about uh, telling adaptive stories. Everybody here in this literature is a methodological materialist. 
the working assumption for most of this literature and for the things I'm going to discuss is that we have an ancient psychology, that, that our developmental psychology is the same developmental psychology that uh, human neonates had uh, in the Pleistocene. That might not be right, but um, it's plausible enough that although we've been subject to selection all the time since we moved out of Africa, the direction of selection may have varied enough that we have the same psychology, developmental psychology that our ancestors did. I'm going to assume for the sake of argument that that's true. And I'm going to focus on a thesis which is central to the attractiveness of evolutionary psychology, namely that proximate and ultimate explanations are by and large methodologically independent. If they weren't, <laughs> then identifying ultimate explanations for human behavior in the environment of evolutionary adaptation wouldn't give you an independent constraint on theorizing about extant proximal mechanisms. So I want to ask, why is it that the enterprise of offering ultimate explanations for behaviors or other phenotypic traits of organisms in the environment of evolutionary adaptation is most of the time pretty nearly disconnected from uh, giving proximate explanations of those very traits. And I think that that's true because almost all the time, but by no means always, um, if you have a scientifically plausible ultimate hypothesis, you have a hypothesis that there was selection for one kind of coat color rather than another uh, at, for predator avoidance, almost always there will be a very large number of plausible proximal explanations about how that change might have been brought about. So, you could be wrong, and you could be wrong because there's no developmental pathway that would have produced that color change, but the risk is fairly low. And similarly, if you have scientifically plausible proximate hypotheses about how something works, you could conceivably be wrong because that couldn't have evolved. But very, very often, uh, given our current knowledge, there'll be a very large number of, of compatible scientifically plausible ultimate hypotheses. So you, by and large, if you're doing evolutionary biology and you're speculating about why there's a coat color change, it would be nice if you had a developmental biologist standing by your side all the time, but you don't always need that, and conversely, okay. Um, and in the, in the special case of humans, or fairly sophisticated animals, if you have a behavioral pattern for those organisms in a narrow range of environments, there are going to be a large number of scientifically uh, plausible developmental hypotheses, any one of which would explain those behaviors in that environment. And similarly, if you have uh, an information processing neurological single state, it's going to be associated with different behavioral manifestations in different environments. So there's, um, this is, I'm rehearsing why we shouldn't be behaviorists. Uh, the, the lead author of this idea in convincing people is sitting right here. Okay, so you can't go from a pattern of behavior in a, on a relatively narrow range of environments automatically to a single hypothesis in developmental psychology. You need a lot more. Okay. I want to emphasize how important it is that you can sometimes do evolutionary ultimate explanations without understanding the details of the proximate mechanisms. So consider kin selection, and I'm going to use this in a broader sense, the, uh, well, I'm going to talk about kin recognition in a broad sense. If there's kin selection, if there are phenotypic traits that are favored in the EEA because of uh, uh, the enhancement of reproductive fitness of kin, or if there are differential response to one's own offspring, that's kinship in a narrower sense, or if there is selection um, uh, against exchanging genes with close relatives, it's necessary that the organisms in which these uh, selective regimes are practiced have some capacity for, here's the jargon, kin recognition. They have to be responsive in the EEA to some parameter which in the environment of evolutionary adaptation is correlated with kinship. Um, and people often uh, call that kin recognition. Here's a methodological qu question. If you have a kin selection explanation, a, select a selective explanation according to which uh, organisms in the EEA respond to relatedness of other organisms, do you always have to specify a developmental hypothesis on the spot before you publish? And the answer is you better not be because most of what we know about kin selection we knew before we could get those developmental hypotheses. Um, methodological independence suggests the answer will be no often, and that's a good thing because we're only recently beginning to understand what some of those mechanisms are, so here's a uh, a really cute chart. This is from Fennig and Sherman's uh, summary article in Scientific American. So 
in all these cases, we have organisms that respond differentially to other organisms, depending on whether they're uh, either offspring or, or kin. So in barn swallows, um, they recognize their own offspring, and they find them uh, by um, uh, location when the, the offspring are young and voice when they're older. Belding's ground squirrels sort things out by the smell of nest mates. Um, paper wasps sort things out by smells that are unique to the plant fibers they used in building a particular nest, so there's a learning involved. Mountain delphiniums respond differently to the pollen of other mountain delphiniums in a way that depends on how closely related they are. They apparently avoid excessive fertilization by closely related mountain delphiniums. Western toads recognize kin by environment and by smell. For sweat bees, it's smell. For acorn woodpeckers, this is really cool. Um, <clears throat> The way their communal breeders and the way in which females avoid um, caring for nestlings that aren't their own to some extent is uh, that they s destroy nearby eggs until they start breeding and then they stop doing it. So this is not perfect, but it's a way of doing kin recognition. And in sea squirts, there's a chemical response to genetic uh, cues that uh, related to that govern fusion. Okay, so there are all sorts of very different ways in which organisms um, respond to kin. The idea that, that in, in most of these cases, the evolutionary scenario that says that very probably there was a recognition of offspring or kin was well established before the details were found out. So you don't ordinarily, there's a kind of methodological independence. The footnote, there are cases where there isn't this kind of independence. The classic one for those of us who grew up as males in the 1950s and loved snakes um, is that uh, there's supposed to have been um, selection for coral snake mimicry. So there are lots of not very poisonous or non-poisonous snakes such that in the, where their range overlaps to coral snakes, they look like coral snakes. And the idea is that they, they, the evolutionary history is that, that avoided predation by birds that feed on snakes. But that, that scenario requires that birds avoid coral snakes, and it's very unlikely that that's learned uh, because coral snake bites are poisonous enough to kill most birds. So that particular evolutionary story requires a psychological hypothesis about innateness of coral snake avoidance in birds. And the current literature, I guess, suggests that that's true, but I, I just read a paper suggesting that the experiments are badly designed. But that's one of those cases where you don't get methodological independence of development and proximal explanations. So let's define the evolutionary function of a trait in the environment of evolutionary adaptation in the way you would. Um, a behaviorally specified evolutionary scenario is one which considers fitness effects of the behaviors themselves, not, for example, other effects of their developmental or psychological plasticity, so uh, uh, realization. So if I tell you that I think um, uh, early humans cared mainly for their own offspring, in the typical case, I'm going to say, well, offspring caring, uh, Child caring behaviors would have had one effect on fitness if they'd been directed towards offspring or close relatives and a different effect of those behaviors on fitness. If I were to try and take into account subtle neurophysiological effects of these patterns of caring, I'd be doing something that's atypical. I'm going to talk about cases where people do the typical thing. And I'm going to define behaviorally equivalent. So I'm going to say that two psychological theories are behaviorally equivalent in an environment E, just in case they predict the same behavioral profile in E. Key theorem. <clears throat> Two psychological theories that are behaviorally equivalent in the EEA are equally compatible with any behaviorally specified evolutionary scenario. So if you think you know, as a result of a really good optimality prediction, that early humans hopped on one foot early in the morning, um, that gives you reason to believe that there's some developmental psychology that led to foot hopping, but it by itself doesn't tell you what that developmental psychology is. So you have to uh, find that out some other way. It's a corollary from the fundamental theorem that behaviorally specified evolutionary scenarios place almost no constraints at all on the developmental psychology that uh, is scientifically credible. If you think you know, as a result of an optimality model, that people um, in the environment of evolutionary adaptation who cared for children cared mainly for their own offspring, that, that's a constraint. But it doesn't by itself tell you anything more about how that constraint is implemented proximally. It doesn't tell you what the role of social learning or innate modules or innate non-modular structures is. It leaves them completely open. 
any developmental psychology that predicts the right behavior profile is equally good from the point of view of evolutionary theory. It might be junk for some other reason. Okay. Um, well, it follows from that that when you engage in the kind of extrapolative sociobiology or evolutionary psychology that I'm concerned to, to criticize, if you think that your scenario favors some particular psychological hypothesis, typically it would be a nativist one, but whatever, uh, over other psychological hypotheses with the same behavioral output in the EA, you've made a mistake. So we can ask, how do people make those inferences? I mean, people do reach conclusions, and I want to sort of talk about inference patterns that I think you'll find are characteristic of the literature of this extrapolative sort. One of them is to infer the propositional content uh, from evolutionary functions. So early human behavior of kind B had evolutionary function F. Conclusion, the underlying but perhaps unconscious motive of contemporary behaviors of kind B is to accomplish something very much like F. Um, you can infer non-malleability in the same way or innateness. Premise, early human behaviors of kind B had evolutionary function F. Conclusion, the underlying but perhaps unconscious motive to accomplish F, to accomplish something very much like F is innate and relatively non-malleable. Maybe you talk about modules. And in both cases, the, the, the examples I use to sort of illustrate the pattern have this form. Wilson thinks, thought once, uh, a long time ago, um, that caring behavior, altruistic behavior in humans reduced individual fitness. Partly, I think that was a confusion between a psychological and an evolutionary meaning of the term altruism. But he concluded correctly. <laughs> that um, it couldn't have been established by kin selection unless there were, from a statistical point of view, kin bias in displays of altruism, or at any rate, displays that had any effect on fitness. But then it turns out that we get an evolved xenophobic disposition. Well, you know, a learned xenophobic disposition would, would work equally well. So would a disposition to have stronger feelings toward familiar people if the right social structure were right. OK. Um, and similarly, in Daly and Wilson, um, what you go is from an idea that, in a certain sense, the evolutionary function of child rearing in the EA is to care for, well, it, halfway through the paper, it seems to change either your own offspring or closely related children or both, uh, to a conclusion that we're hardwired to have that preference structure, which we might be. But the number of possible explanations for the behaviors posited in the EEA is legion. OK, here's an alternative inference to um, non malleability, which is. Um, Rare in the literature, but very common in everyday and philosophical conversations. Early human behavior of kind B had evolutionary function F. Here's an intermediate conclusion. Behaviors of kind B had a biological basis or had a genetic basis. Uh, conclusion, the underlying but perhaps unconscious motive to accomplish something very much like F is innate and relatively non-malleable. No one here but us sophisticated geneticists. We know that traits can be, uh, uh, have a high genetic component and nevertheless be highly malleable because there's gene-environment interaction. But um, if you engage in conversations with philosophers about moral psychology, you will find that people who lecture on why this inference isn't legitimate will often make it. Um, Here's a sophisticated version of the previous fallacious pattern. Um, you use key terms like psychological adaptation, evolved psychology, evolved concepts, evolved strategies, evolved tactics, evolved adaptations, psychological systems designed by natural selection for some particular task, cognitive adaptations, psychological adaptations ambiguously. You use these terms to do two things simultaneously to report an evolutionary scenario for behaviors in the environment of uh, evolutionary adaptation and to propose something like a particular innate domain specific, something like a module, uh, to explain those behaviors and also to explain behaviors outside the EEA. The tacit or explicit, and I think false presupposition here, is that scenarios of this sort imply or strongly support conclusions of the second sort. And people just do this all the time. This is widespread in the literature where, where someone is simultaneously describing a scenario in terms of selection and putting forward her or his behavioral science, uh, psych psychological hypothesis at the same time. So here's one. Uh, so this is from uh, Crimino and, uh, and uh, Delton on perception of newcomers, psychological in which the term psychological adaptations evolve psychology evolved concept as in evolved newcomer concept and specialized psychology occur. 
Human coalitions frequently persist through multiple overlapping membership generations acquiring new members to cooperate and coordinate with veteran members. Does the mind contain psychological adaptations for interacting with these intergenerational uh, coalitions? Recent work in evolutionary psychologists Psychology suggests the existence of psychological adaptations for some aspects of coalition and cooperation. Um, and these are, uh, they're being described as adaptations, but the implication is that there will be a specialized psychology that goes with them. So there's a, a glide from a description of evolutionary function to a description of content of something like a motive or uh, a computational architecture. Here's another example where evolved tactics and evolved adaptation play the same role. Uh, this is from uh, Duntley and Buss on stalking. We propose that stalking tactics have been shaped by evolutionary processes to help solve mating problems. Our theory represents a departure from the prior theory of stalking and its central premise that humans have evolved adaptations for stalking. Now, if what they meant by that was simply in the EEA, men stalked women, and that, that behavior was an adaptation in the EEA. That wouldn't be a psychological hypothesis about anything. It would, it would imply that psychological development in the EEA results in such behaviors, but they're talking about evolved adaptations that we currently have. So there's a glide from the terminology of an adaptive scenario to the terminology of roughly hardwired structures Here's another one where the key terms are distinct psychological systems designed by natural selection um, to solve specific problems, cognitive adaptations. The authors propose that the phenomenon currently placed under the general rubric, uh, rubric of st stigma involve a set of distinct psychological systems designed by natural selection to solve specific problems associated with sociality. In particular, the author suggests that human beings possess cognitive adaptations designed to cause them to avoid certain uh, pathological situations, then it's clear that what's meant by cognitive adaptation is simultaneously something that happened in the EEA that had a cognitive component that gave rise to behavior and something we still have. Okay, so there's this glide from um, a description of evolutionary function to a description of an uh, information processing structure that's preserved. Um, okay. Uh, here's another example from Cosmides and Tubi, um, the uh, early paper. The evolutionary function of the human brain is to process information in ways that lead to adaptive behavior. The mind is a description of the operation of a brain that maps informational input into behavioral output. So far, as far as I'm concerned, so good. Regarding kid selection, an organism's behavior cannot fall within the bounds of the constraints imposed by evolutionary process unless it is guided by cognitive processes that can serve certain, solve certain information processing problems that are very specific. To confer the benefits on kin in accordance with the constraints of kin selection theory, the organism must have cognitive programs that allow it to extract certain information from its environment, who are its relatives, which are close kin, which is distance, what are the costs and benefits of the action to itself, to its kin, the organism's behavior will be random with respect to the constraints of kin selection theory unless it has some means of extracting information relevant to these questions and has well-defined decision rules. Okay, what you have is a situation in which um, intuitively, if you summarize a meta an evolutionary metaphor, you say these organisms are behaving so as to benefit their kin, and you're not attributing to them a conscious motive to benefit kin, but you're, uh, you're attributing to them a set of computational procedures that would be very much like the ones they would use if they had a conscious motive. And the slogan for the rest of this talk is remember mountain delphiniums. Um, they surely don't do anything like that. Uh, here's yet another um, uh, pattern of inference. And I, I, this is important because I want to return to it when I talk about what happens when psychologists and philosophers think about human nature in, in the case of doing social theory or moral theory. And that's to infer a particular psychological conclusion by inappropriately narrowing the range of alternatives. And here's how it works. For a particular pattern of human behavior, you assume that the only competing explanations are the sociobiological or evolutionary theory du jour for that, those behaviors and the blank slate theory, according to which it's entirely highly malleable and will vary from culture to culture all over the place. You then show that it's widespread across cultures so that the blank, the grandiose grand, the blank slate theory is ruled out, and you conclude that the sociobiological or evolutionary psych theory du jour is correct, and you will be ignoring social explanations. I think it's a funny example. Uh, it, Alcock in The Triumph of Sociobiology um, talks about a kin selection uh, story for tribal rivalry behaviors. Um, 
And uh, he, he concludes on the basis of this that it's plausible to think we're hardwired for systematic genocide and that this explains recent and contemporary genocide. And then he takes to be the relevant alternative the view that um, uh, genocide is a rare product of peculiar social circumstances. He gives you a map, of, a horrifying map, showing all the places in the world where there's been genocide and uh, this uh, relevant alternative is rejected, so we go back to this explanation. Well, look, um, all sorts of social hypotheses about what kinds of social structures give rise to genocide have disappeared. You know, it's, there aren't two alternatives. It's, a, it's something that happens essentially, it's a peculiarity of particular cultures that were hardwired to do it. It could be that, for example, certain patterns of social stratification give rise to uh, armies and, and um, uh, the capacity for genocide. And in fact, that's the real debate among archeologists about this. Um, the real debate, I, I'm told by my friends who are, in, who are archeologists and anthropologists, is whether the first systematic warfare occurred between relatively unstructured small uh, tribal groups, or whether in order to have a capacity for systematic genocide, you needed social stratification, so you could have a warrior uh, class. So here you, here you have the, the, the interesting structural explanation is just not even on the table, okay. So I wanna say, here is this junk. Here are these patterns of inference. The conclusions might be true, but they're not recommended by the evolutionary scenarios, even if you think the scenarios have to restrict your your psych uh, theory of developmental psychology to one that predicts the behaviors. So I want to uh, raise a bunch of questions. What, well, haven't I missed massive modularity? Haven't I missed the fact that there are, there's another assumption of something like um, uh, uh, evolution having given us a whole bunch of things that are something like modularized, one, one per purpose. Um, given that uh, unjust, suppose that I can address this question, Given that unjustified patterns of inference give, uh, lead people from evolutionary scenarios to nativist conclusions, is that a feature of the distant past and the bad old sociobiology days that's gone away in evolutionary psych? Does it persist? How can we characterize the role in psychological methodology if it does persist? How should we assess the methodological importance in psychology? Why should we care? And what are the implications for questions of interest to philosophers? I want to consider first the, the obvious challenge that I have sort of missed one of the premises that, that underwrites the literature I'm criticizing, namely something like massive modularity. There's a, a story about what kind of mating behavior would have occurred in the EEA, and, the, and, and that underwrites the idea that we're hardwired to have some differences in um, uh, how we choose partners. So, so the predictions are that sexes have a largely innate and relatively non-malleable preference structure. That's the psychological conclusion. And what I want to talk about is what the data look like. And I want to ask the question, would these data be taken to support a claim about innate sex differences if neither the evolutionary scenario nor a lot of sexist prejudice had not operated? So what are the data like? Um, so, um, they predicted sex differences uh, uh, um, appear in, in the right way in uh, survey data from 37 countries. The sex differences in people's descriptions of their preference on questionnaires matches the predicted differences in actual preference, which are supposed to follow from the evolutionarily uh, grounded theory. There are several problems with these data. One thing is survey data. Uh, and we know in general that you don't learn very much about what people like by what they say they like, but okay. Um, as it happens, um, if you ask men and women, this is, this is true of both about buses data and about uh, subsequent studies, if you ask people on a questionnaire to list the characteristics they would most like in a, uh, in a romantic partner, roughly speaking, men and women say kindness, understanding, and intelligence first. That is, the, the, the lead answers are the same. Whether that's got anything to do with how people choose mates, I don't know, but if you ask people, um, what they think they want. It's true that, that resources rank higher for women than for men, uh, but the, the key answers are, are the same. Um, in replications of the studies, the, um, I, I said, me, I wrote median and I meant modal. The modal answer to the question, how many sex partners do you want is one, which already tells you that these survey data have very little to do with actual sexual behavior. 
Um, no, it really does. No, I'm, I'm quite, I mean, I know it's funny, but look, if you're, if you're, if, if, if you're making predictions about actual sexual behavior, uh, but the other thing is that um, there are standard survey techniques where you, leave, you uh, throw out outlying data. So here you have, you, you're, you've got a bunch of undergraduates in uh, a class, and they're taking Psych 101 or whatever, and you ask them how many sex partners they're likely to have, and some guy writes 3,000. If you do that, if you, if you um, throw out the outliers, there's only a small difference in the answers between men and women. Um, okay, now ask yourself, suppose someone said, look, I think I've established that there's very probably an innate difference in uh, preference between men and women. They differ in what they want in, in partners. Of course, they agree down to about list four or five, but you know, there's this deep difference. And by the way, um, the number of sex partners they want is different. Now, of course, the, the modal answer is one, but if you, if you just average, see how much bigger the score is for men than for women. If you didn't, if the word evolution had not been sprinkled over this paper, or if you were not deeply uh, influenced um, by uh, stereotypes about sex differences, I don't think you would have thought that this was a paper that prima facie made a case for innate or non-malleable differences. Um, I think you'd think it was junk. On the other hand, it's presented in a context in which it's presented by the authors, and no doubt, uh, quite honestly, <laughs> um, as something recommended to us by the best confirmed theory in all of biology. Well, it's not irrational to give a, 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 a theory special credence if it's recommended by the best confirmed theory in all of biology. It just isn't. <laughs> um, and here's a more recent example um, on the evolution, uh, evolutionary, evolutionary origins of stigmatization. Um, I'll try and do this. I'm running out of Interesting paper. Um, these guys think that evolutionary theory predicts that in deciding how trustworthy uh, people are in uh, cooperative uh, coalitions, um, early humans will have paid attention to tenure in the group. And I take it that that's the idea that tenure is roughly proxy for reliability because you get tossed out uh, if you're not reliable. And that, that, that might well be true. And, um, but, um, non-arbitrary evolved adaptations designed to cause, um, because psychological systems are everywhere endowed with the same psychological systems, this is an innateness proposal, not merely a proposal. It's not the proposal that very probably early humans used tenure and membership in, in uh, cooperative groups as among the cues to reliability. It's that they're sort of wired to do that. And um, there were experiments designed to show that the mind categorizes coalition members by tenure, including newcomers, and that the tenure categorization persists in the light of additional data, orthogonal data, and that the evaluation that people make of members of a, of a, of a coalition are influenced by the information they have about um, tenure. I, I'm gonna run out, I'm not gonna describe the details of the experiment, but it, it's a, the experiments are neat. Um, and, um, what they show is that if you show experimental subjects pictures of people that you tell, you, you tell the experimental subjects are part of an imaginary group of uh, cooperators, I think they are ice something. Uh, what are they called? Ice walkers. <laughs> that in various ways, they really do pay attention to the uh, duration you've assigned uh, to the, the, these pictures as members of the ice climbers group. So there are memory tasks in which their performances are skewed by commonalities and assignment of duration. So they pay attention to this parameter. This parameter by itself has some impact on how reliable or honorable or trustworthy they think uh, these ice climbers are, even when there are other data that are, uh, you might think would lead in the contrary direction. Um, so tenure plays a role, um, it plays a role in, in their classificatory judgments, and it plays a role in their evaluation of the extent to which uh, these ice climbers are good guys, even when there's data about free riding, which you might think is the data they, the data they should really pay attention to, even when, that, when those data are, are present. Um, um, cooperating veterans, that is, veterans that are said to not have been free riding, and uh, cooperating newcomers are distinguished from each other. So if you tell the experimental subjects uh, that 
Uh, this picture is someone who's cooperated, and this is also a picture of someone who's cooperated, but this one's been in the group longer. They make a more favorable evaluation. They don't, they don't distinguish um, uh, free-riding veterans and, uh, uh, and free-riding newcomers. They diss those. And sex matters to their behavior, but so does tenure. Okay, so um, here's the puzzle. The data collected by uh, these researchers perhaps show that experimental subjects would in real life pay attention to tenure in actual cooperative um, situations, okay? You ask them what they would do, and, and they say they would do it, and maybe that provides evidence, uh, but there's no attempt whatsoever in the paper to address the question of innateness or modularity. Um, the fundamental theorem says that even if the behavior pattern they had in mind occurred in the EEA, and even if it were modularized, it might not be sensitive to the particular way in which the tenure data are presented, namely uh, something written out over a picture. Um, so what to say about this? Okay, I want to, I want to indicate something about the role of bias and projectability judgments here, because I don't want, I, there's, you could say, ah, this is a junk study. I, don't, I, I, I want to say something very different. But here's the, here, here you have a paper that is supposed to provide preliminary evidence for modularized structures, and there's no experimental evidence that addresses plasticity or innateness. So here's one thing you might say. You might say, this is just a preliminary study, and, and the authors make it clear that it is just a preliminary study, and I think that's, that's, that's right. But here's what they say. They say these results provide preliminary evidence for a specialized component of human coalitional psychology and evolved, and that carries implications of innateness and non-malleability or something like that, concept of newcomer. Well, um, their data don't provide any evidence along those lines. Is that just because they don't know how to do science? Answer, of course not. Uh, there's no individual culpability going on here. As their own methodological uh, statements in the paper make clear, the study's methodology presupposes that evolutionary theory favors modularity with a kind of propositional content that, that's taken for granted here. Um, the same presupposition is a presupposition shared by the intended audience of other people who are doing evolutionary psychology. This is a, this is a shared paradigmatic commitment. So most readers of Human Nature, or where it was published, are likely to share that commitment. So what, these, what, what, what this study addresses is an insider question. Suppose you are already a participant in this paradigm for what you take to be good scientific reason. <laughs> Could it be that there's evidence that there's a newcomer module operating either in addition to or instead of an already posited free rider detection module? Absolutely nothing wrong with operating in a literature that has a, a, a certain presupposition and a, ra a raising an insider question. You're not culpable if you do that. On the other hand, <clears throat> suppose that evolutionary theory doesn't favor this picture, um, that, uh, uh, that uh, there's a modularity with content approximately equal to evolutionary function, um, then for insiders, <laughs> they've been misled by a false methodological presupposition into which they were trained, okay? We're not talking about assigning blame, but that's an unfortunate situation. But I'm more interested in the way in which uh, grounding psychological research in evolutionary theory has an impact on outsiders, people who are psychologists or philosophers who haven't thought through all this, who may be misled because they will think, not having thought it through, that evolutionary psychology is actually evolutionary psychology. They will think, my colleagues who are doing evolutionary psychology have uh, narrowed the choice space in a way that evolutionary theory dictates, so uh, these findings, uh, they are preliminary findings showing something, okay? I think that's what I'm meaning by methodological anesthesia. Um, I'm gonna skip a bunch of stuff. I claim that these inference patterns are so central to the meaning, to the way in which these papers are written, that if you don't take them on board, either critically or uncritically, you can't read the papers. So in a certain sense, they're meaning constitutive. And that leads me to think that um, uh, certain inferential role semantic theories don't work, but I won't do that. I wanna talk about moral psychology. <laughs> um, there's an important recent metaphilosophical trend. Philosophers want to be philosophical naturalists, and they want philosophy. When they say that philosophy is continuous with the empirical sciences, they don't want to mean what Quine apparently meant, behaviorist psychology and the physics department. They, they, they want uh, philosophical thinking to actually either involve running experiments or to be intimately connected with ongoing experimental work. I think that's really cool. 
Um, but I want, to, uh, I want to issue a warning that in the case of moral psychology, this kind of methodological anesthesia may be very widespread. Uh, just a reminder about how little evolutionary theory seems to actually constrain behavior. Almost every conception of the nature and extent of human altruism that anyone has ever been proposed has been defended on evolutionary grounds in the last 25 years. So it doesn't look as though trying to be evolutionary gets you very far. You can ask two questions about moral judgments. You can ask how they should be made, uh, and you could uh, ask uh, how are they actually made. All sorts of views about how we should make moral judgments, but there's a kind of common sense answer to the question, how do people actually make moral judgments? That is, moral philosophers and, and, uh, who differ profoundly about what kinds of moral judgments we should make, or even whether we should make them, will agree that there are emotional responses involved, there are calculations of outcome involved, there are considerations of uh, uh, fairness, religion, reason, deliberation, unreason, prejudice, unconscious, conscious reasoning. No, no working philosopher, until recently, would have, would have thought that actual moral psychology and the making of moral judgment didn't involve a motley array, array of factors. Okay, but there are two empirical approaches which philosophers and others have taken seriously, where empirical work on moral psychology is thought to uh, say something different, and I, I, I have in mind work of Jonathan Haidt at Virginia and Mark Hauser at Harvard, their common elements are that they think that most or much, depending on the, they differ subtly, uh, moral thinking is regulated by innate and automatic responses rather than, mean, than by deliberation, that these underlying structures are products of evolution, and that conscious, reasoned, argumentative deliberation of the sort we, as philosophers, love, play a limited, quite limited role in, in moral decision making. Of course, they differ in that they offer utterly different accounts of what the underlying structures are. I want to talk about how good the methods are, and I want to focus on Haidt's theory. According to Haidt, there's an explicit evolutionary component. Um, he thinks that on evolutionary grounds, we should think that the evolutionary function of moral practices in the EEA was to stabilize social relations, and he thinks that uh, that's what they still do. And um, he thinks that there are innate components that are quickly manifested in positive or negative affective responses. Uh, Often the list is harm, care, fairness, reciprocity, authority, respect, purity, sanctity, and in-group and out-group boundaries. The list is varied somewhat from publication to publication, but he thinks that there's anthropological evidence and evolutionary reason for thinking these are present. Uh, he thinks that the role of rational deliberation or discussion is not to figure out how to stabilize relations, but instead to establish a, a pattern of similar affective responses. So he thinks that when people engage in deliberative, what they take to be deliberative reasoning and ethics, they're doing something very different from what they do if they're doing science or engineering or everyday planning. Um, in the latter case, their, act, their deliberations actually matter um, in terms of the quality of the argument. In the case of morals, what we're doing is we're, we're, we think we're deliberating, but what we're really doing is equilibrating our affective responses. Um, okay. um, what's novel, or lots of things are novel here, uh, um, innateness, you might think that these concerns uh, that he focuses on are acquired through social learning. And there's another thing, it's true, that, that uh, on most views, these two loom large, but he adds several others. But what I want to focus on is the claim that, we, that our deliberation is essentially sham deliberation, not that we're being dishonest. Okay. Um, almost all accounts of morality as stabilizing, ancient accounts, modern accounts, philosophical accounts, sociobiological accounts, have it that morally grounded cooperation is partly a cognitive achievement. We, you know, even if you're a relativist, you think that we sort of work it out together. Um, and um, Haidt thinks that's not appropriate. I'll skip stuff about dual process. I'm gonna talk about evidence for his claims. If you ask why the emotional responses that he chose are on the list, he thinks that they're suggested by the anthropological literature and by evolution. Why should we think that they're immodular or innate or something like that? Well, they're widespread and they could have been established by selection. Why do we think they're operative? Well, fMRI data show that parts of the brain associated with emotion are activated during moral thinking, and that brain injuries that affect uh, parts of the brain associated with emotion have an effect on moral judgment. And um, you, can, you can change experimental subjects' judgments by using emotionally charged language. Now, I take it that uh, we already knew that emotions uh, of this sort operated, but it, look, I mean, 
common knowledge is sometimes false. So let's, let's agree that these data uh, enhance our belief. But none of these things address the question of whether rational deliberation plays, or apparent rational deliberation plays a different role in ethics than in science. Okay. Um, he says the key question was whether subjects would behave like idealized scientists or like idealized, or like lawyers. So here's the experimental design. You present subjects with moral dilemmas and you get their initial reaction, and then you, the people running the experiments play devil's advocate. They choose real moral dilemmas where it's known what the initial move structure is. So you say, you should throw the person in front of the train, and the, 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 uh, the experimenter knows what the obvious uh, deontological response is. Okay. So the um, experimenter and the, uh, the experimental subject go through a series of exchanges in which the um, experimental plays doubles advocate, and here are the findings. There is a phenomenon of moral dumbfounding. Generally, the experimental subjects don't give very good arguments. They stick to their conclusions even when their arguments have apparently been cogently challenged, and even when they're forced to admit that they don't know how to justify their views. And the conclusion is they behave like lawyers, not like ideal scientists, though the conscious deliberation and rational argument as such play little role in determining moral judgments. That's the experiment. Okay, here's some interesting uh, features, things you might worry about. Simple worry is that these experiments are confrontational, and you might ask what would happen if you did interviews where you ask people for their judgments, but you allow the, the, the conversation to flow differently. But here, here's the striking thing. There's a comparison being made between ethical and scientific judgments with no comparative data. No data are collected about scientific judgments at all. Instead, the behavior of these experimental subjects is compared with the behavior of ideal scientists. Okay, well, that's already pe peculiar, but it's not at all clear that ideal scientists should uh, abandon their central beliefs uh, if they're challenged by a bright undergraduate running an experiment. Remember, these are not, these are not psych professional philosophers or even philosophy they're random, random subjects. Suppose we got a whole bunch of astrophysicists and physicists and chemists, not very many biologists, we asked them whether they believed in evolutionary theory, and then uh, we had our people doing the experiments run through the standard puzzles of, uh, about that, that are already in the chapter Difficulties on Theory in Darwin. I suspect that a fairly, we, we could find this out, I, actually there's work being done on this, but suppose you found out that most astrophysicists, when challenged about evolutionary theory, are dumbfounded. They, they, they don't know. They, don't know, they can't invent kin selection on the spot, so they don't know how the neuter casts and the social insects evolved. And they, they, Would you count them as non-ideal scientists if they didn't at the end of this 15-minute experiment say, oh, golly, I just don't believe in evolutionary theory? I mean, it's not at all clear that you should abandon <laughs> um, a view that's that well entrenched that your colleagues hold just because you get confused. Um, Consider intuitive automatic judgments by skilled diagnosticians, okay? Suppose you ran an experiment in which you, you found you could dumbfound skilled diagnosticians. I don't know whether you can or not, but suppose that in an experimental situation where you had weird circumstances, unusual cases, the uh, skilled diagnostician makes an initial diagnosis and then you, you say, well, what about this? What about that? What about the other? Suppose that you could routinely confuse skilled diagnosticians and they, they stuck with their judgment even so. I don't know whether they should do that or not, but if they did, you might think there was some defect, but you wouldn't conclude that deliberative reasoning plays no role in diagnostic medicine. You would think there was something to, peculiar to the experimental circumstances. Also, look, these are moral dilemmas. The, the, the experimental machinery was chosen so we know in advance people get confused, okay? Instead of presenting subjects with complicated moral situations where you might think you might be able to get a solution by deliberative reasoning, it's not a, it's not a, a runaway train thing about what to do if, if grandmother is, is ill and needs care and there are three different siblings who are trying to sort stuff out. No, no such experimental study. This is hopelessly bad design, but it's still influential. <laughs> It's widely cited. Uh, he, uh, Haidt has made himself a public intellectual, and I'll talk about that on the next slide. So ask yourself, why would anyone believe that a study whose conclusion is a comparison of scientific and, and moral reasoning where no scientific reasoning has been experimentally examined uh, is highly credible? I, I'm proposing that the answer is that if you sprinkle the word evolution over something, and if the conclusion is cynical enough, <laughs> 
there is an a methodologically <laughs> anesthetic effect. Now, um, uh, Mark Fedick is at Yale at Connecticut College and Barbara Kosowski is at Cornell, are already running a series of very simple experiments in which they have non-controversial, non-confrontational interview uh, data. And the, 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 they, they're not ready to publish it yet, but it looks as though pretty complicated, if you, if you sort of let people do it and you say, oh, tell me some more, you get fairly complicated reasoning in which people try things out and then change their mind. Uh, whether that will turn out to show that if you ran a different sort of experiment, you get different results, we don't know yet. But remember, they're going to, and Haidt never did, study scientific reasoning. So I want to talk about how do you get anesthesia cubed. <laughs> and then this is the last slide. Um, basic scientific practice is to subject a theory to greater scrutiny if it's initially implausible, or it's not from established research institution, or it's not published in a major journal. If it has all those, honor those honorability making factors, you subject it to le less scrutiny. I think the real question for many biologists and psychologists and philosophers who are interested in uh, human psychology is actually a question they don't publish, but this is something that Haidt has explicitly addressed. They want to know why are other people so irrational, so warlike, so selfish, so racist, so sexist. So Haidt has actually published the idea that the reason people vote Republican, which I think he thinks they shouldn't do, is you see there are these five affective modules and Democrats push the buttons on only two of them whereas Republicans push the button on all five. So he's, there's behavior he would rather not see, and his question is, yeah, why are people doing this? And there's a tacit assumption very often that the answer is going to lie in individual psychology, features of ways in which everybody but me is defective, <laughs> not in features of social institutions. Well, suppose that T is a mainstream evolutionary psychology pessimistic answer. <laughs> then it seems to me that we'll have none, uh, th that um, it will, um, uh, it will have none of these prima facie deficiencies. Uh, it will be published, it will not be initially implausible because I'm already cynical. It'll, it'll come from an established research institution. It'll be published in a major journal like Science where some of his stuff is. Uh, initially, it'll, it'll seem to me to be uh, uh, initially plausible because it fits my pessimistic picture and famous people have said it, that's anesthesia. I think that it's um, uh, supported by evolutionary theory, so the anesthesia is squared. And I will sub subject the evidence for it to very minimal scrutiny on those guns so I get anesthesia cubed. Um, I want to emphasize that the concern about irrational voting behavior is actually part of Haidt's published motive. I mean, it's a very good question, why do people vote as they do? And if you think they're voting badly, it's an anguish question, you know, why this happens, but uh, I think that evolutionary theory simply provides an anesthetic that keeps people from running the experiments uh, that they should run. Thanks. <laughs>